Uh, how does uh, Dharma, if you just want to maybe low a couple of times, I just want to um, make sure that everyone else out there can hear you. So if folks, when you, when you hear Dharma, if you can just, if a couple of people can just let us know if you can hear it clearly. Thank you. Hey, this is Dharma Daly. I'm one of the folks that started um, WGXT Hands-On Radio in upstate New York. Okay, good. It looks like uh, folks can hear you. Okay, so um, I guess we're a few minutes after eight now, so I'm just going to get started. It seems like we might have some issues with the sound. It might be a little fuzzy, but um, we're going to just uh, keep moving forward here and, and get, get things going. So uh, tonight you're joining us. I just want to thank everyone again for um, joining the webinar tonight. It's great to see so much excitement and so many of our applicants and folks excited about Low Power FM Radio uh, and uh, working with us here at the Prometheus Radio Project. Tonight, um, our webinar is about community engagement. It's about determining the needs of your community, and I would say communities us are involved in organizing and other projects uh, that have us um, engaged and working with communities uh, not only that we might not represent, but reaching across and making connections among different communities. So thinking, keeping that in mind, as well as uh, we're going to be talking about strategies to increase participation, so different strategies to get folks involved in our radio projects and also how our radio projects, I believe we're going to be talking about how those radio projects can, can get us um, to be uh, engaged beyond, um, beyond those, so media making for uh, uh, movement building, which is really exciting. Uh, I just, uh, again, I'm really excited that folks are here. Uh, and uh, I'm, as I can see, most folks are familiar with the chat box, so you can use that to let us know how you're doing. And then, of course, we'll be using that chat box later for the question and answer period. Uh, I'm just going to introduce myself again for folks who are joining the call. Uh, my name is Leah Gerardo, and I'm the Education and Training Coordinator here at the Prometheus Radio Project. Tonight, we've got some excellent presentations about engaging with communities. Um, we have Vicki Weeks joining us, Dharma Daly, and also Danielle Chenoweth. Uh, I'll introduce, introduce those uh, presenters to you um, as uh, right before they make their presentations. Um, I just wanted to let folks know a little bit about some uh, upcoming webinars. Like I was saying earlier, this is part of a series um, that we're starting right now on a lot of the different elements that you will need. Um, that you may need to get your station going and to, and to get ready to apply for your license this fall. Uh, so keep an eye on our, um, on our website. That's prometheusradio.org slash webinars. I've listed a couple of the upcoming ones here that are uh, going to be happening in the next few weeks. We have Finding a Viable Transmission Site. And so this is actually where your transmitter will live. Um, that's happening with Will Floyd and Anna Martina, who are um, tech folks that are on our staff here at Prometheus. And that will be next Wednesday, August 21st at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. There's also going to be uh, another walkthrough. So one happened a few weeks ago, and we're going to have another one of those um, straightforward how to apply for an FCC community radio license. That's going to uh, help you navigate the application. And uh, that's with Ian Smith, who's our program director, and Sanjay Jolly, who is the policy director here at the Prometheus Radio Project. And then another one that's coming up in early September is what is a participatory radio station creating democratic governance structures? Uh, that's going to be Thursday, September 5th. Um, and we have Arlene Sweeting from WSLR and Courtney Kirby, uh, Community News and Volunteer Coordina Coordinator at CKUT. Um, uh, CKUT, of course, in, uh, in Montreal and uh, not a U.S. station, but has some um, really awesome uh, governance structure, and so I thought folks might um, like to hear about what they're up to up there. Uh, and again, if you see these webinars or if you want to review anything that we uh, discussed tonight, you're, you'll be able to access a recording of this training. That's at prometheusradio.org slash archives. And there's also a wealth of uh, other information there from other um, webinars that have taken place in the past here at Prometheus. Okay, so I just want to start by giving a little bit of a background about Prometheus for some people who might not be completely familiar with what we do. The Prometheus Radio Project is a not-for-profit based in Philadelphia. We've been around for about 15 years doing work to build participatory radio as a voice for community expression and as a tool for social justice organizing. We exist to counter corporate consolidation and control of the media. 
Over time, as we know, the media has become less and less accessible to communities as corporations have acquired a bigger share of the media landscape. Today, um, a corporation like Clear Channel owns over 850 radio stations across the country. And what this means is that we hear the same songs, we hear the same news, and we hear a really particular um, angle on the kinds of things that are, are being reported on. And what we're lacking is local coverage and local artists. Most of our media is produced by a small handful of corporations whose interests are often quite different from that of the communities that end up consuming that media. So what we need is our own versions of those stories to be out there. We need our own news to combat stereotypes, to speak truth to power, to create positive changes uh, in our communities. So for the past 13 years, Prometheus has helped hundreds of communities start their own radio stations. Today, over 800 low-power FM stations are on the air. And this fall, of course, there's new opportunities for low-power radio stations, um, and that's what we're here to talk a little bit tonight or get excited about tonight. Um, and that has happened from about a decade of organizing uh, here at Prometheus um, through a grassroots legislative campaign to open up the airwaves uh, in urban areas. And that's particularly important to us because in urban areas, low power FM, which has um, a smaller broadcast range, can still reach 100,000 listeners and have a massive impact. Um, and of course, this is all happening because of the Local Community Radio Act, uh, which passed in January of 2011, which directs the FCC to, um, to create more opportunities. Um, I'm just going to take a pause here and just ask maybe all the presenters to make sure they're muted because there's quite a lot of static on the line and I'm not sure. I have a feeling that might be um, getting picked up by other people out there. So folks can, if we can just do a quick little sound check and folks let me know how they're doing out there. Ah, there we go. Perfect. Um, so I'm just going to um, talk a little bit uh, a minute more about Prometheus and then we're going to get to our, our awesome uh, speakers who are joining us tonight. Um, so when I say community radio, what we mean at Prometheus, at the Prometheus Radio Project is um, transformative uh, and that's that it's transformative for both listeners and media makers. We mean radio that is participatory, that it's democratically organized with community involvement in the production of content, and we mean radio that's affordable and accessible with multimedia capabilities uh, that are locally rooted. And uh, as it says here, we advocate for community radio stations which empower community voices and movements for social change. And our primary focus is on building a large community of low power FM stations and listeners across the nation. Um, I just want to also uh, let people know that here at Prometheus, of course, we're on the ground in communities across the country. Um, working with grassroots groups that many of you are probably part of. And we offer these trainings free because um, that's part of what we do here. We want to make sure that we're spreading information and uh, resources to build these participatory uh, radio stations. And um, I just want to let folks know that if you have the capability and interest, of course you can support us here at Prometheus. Uh, the website is up there. Um, so consider supporting Prometheus and um, your financial support as well as all the amazing other support that we get from you, of course, um, helps us build a better media future. Um, so community media making means the participation and support of a broad base of participants. To create a participatory community radio station requires considering who might not already be represented in the media and building relationships that make your station a place for diverse content through supporting communities and movements. Our guest speakers are going to discuss different outreach tools including community needs assessment and a variety of other awesome strategies. They will discuss what it takes to build relationships among multiple communities that will strengthen and build a community radio station. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to um, move to uh, getting the speakers uh, to um, give us their pass along their knowledge. Um, the first speaker that we're um, going to have uh, present to us tonight is uh, Vicki Weeks. Um, Vicki has over 25 years in business management and organizational development, including 20 years serving as counsel and trainer to nonprofit organizations. She served as an ex uh, in an executive capacity in both the private and nonprofit sectors and has served on a number of national and regional nonprofit boards. 
Vicki relocated to Savannah, Georgia from the Florida Keys and serves as the president of Weeks Consulting. An effective coach and facilitator, she has assisted organizations of all sizes from local to national with community outreach, issue advocacy, communications, and resource development. Most recently, she has been helping clients transition to cloud-based CRM and implement time and cost-effective social media strategies. Prior to establishing Weeks Consulting, uh, Vicki was the founder and president of Watersport People, Inc., a multi-location retail and specialty sports business that trained hundreds of people in scuba diving, sailing, and other water-related sports. Vicki now calls Savannah her home, where she has been helping the Unitarian Universalist Church of Savannah with their bid to build a low-power community radio station. You can reach Vicki through her website, weeksconsulting.com. Uh, so Vicki, uh, I'm just going to pass it over to you. I'm going to bring up your first slide here, and uh, please go. Thanks, uh, Leah, and uh, just wanted to say thanks to yourself and Ian and Jeff and the rest of the Prometheus team because uh, the work you guys are doing to help communities get new low-power FM stations up and running is really pretty invaluable. Um, and thanks, too, for the opportunity to talk about the work I'm doing with the uh, UU Church of Savannah here. Um, as people start up their uh, process, and I imagine most of the people who are on this call have uh, taken these initial steps, but just in case, you know, one of the things you really want to start with is identifying the, the, your community connection. You know, bottom line is, who are you? Uh, some of our groups that are working to set up these new stations are working through their own organization, but others are actually connecting with nonprofit groups or organizations in their community and having them sponsor uh, their application. And one of the things you really want to make sure is that your mission and vision and values of, of the people who are doing the work to get this station up and running are compatible with the people who are going to be owning the license. And you want to be clear. You want to be clear about what's your mission. And, and uh, definition of mission, it, what, is, what is the work that you're doing? Uh, for example, for the UU Church here, they're, their mission is to provide voice and visibility in Savannah for Unitarian Universalism, community nonprofits, organizations, events, and talent that aligns with the Unitarian Universalist values. So that's what they're going to do. Well, you also want to know what your vision is, because your vision is about what difference you're going to make in community. How is the, com the community going to be different three years down the road or five years down the road or ten years down the road because your station exists? And so it, it, it not only gives you something to work toward, but it also gives you um, a way to measure your progress because is your vision coming into reality or is it not? For example, with the the vision for this, the UU Church that I'm helping on this project is that the Savannah community has a better understanding of uh, their the Unitarian Universalism and its values, but also that the community has an opportunity to experience those values through their radio programming and that they ensure that local news and talent and organizations that don't get enough airtime at, at commercial outlets have a home and some visibility in the community, and, and that the community can be full partners in the programming of the station to make sure that all the local needs are being met. So, so this gives them a way to say, okay, here's our vision. Are we actually getting there? Are, are we making this difference? And then finally, you want to make sure that your value, you, you understand your values and that they're compatible with the work that you're intending to do. So once you know who you are, <laughs> you, you want to uh, reach out and take a look up at who is it that you're hoping to benefit? Who are you doing the work for? And, and you need to sort of, I think, take uh, an, a look from an internal and an external perspective because we see things in community happening that we think uh, need to be addressed. We see 
changes that we think need to be made. We 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 see um, pieces that are missing that we think need to be that are crucial to be filled. Well, that's what we see. But if we're addressing communities outside our own specific community, we need to be very cognizant of how does. How do other sectors of the community or how do the communities see what needs to be done? What are their needs? What are their values? And, and do these mesh in terms of what we're trying to do? And so that's when we go ahead and we start putting together our, um, our, our assessment. And, and a community needs assessment or, you know, in business terms, you can think of it as a, a marketing survey or marketing assessment. And basically, I think it's important to really um, recognize that this is really a two-way communication. Yes, you're reaching out to these communities to gather up information about who they are, what they want, what they need, what they see as missing in, in the current uh, community media uh, sphere. But it is also a step in your outreach because what you're doing is reaching out to members uh, of the community that you're needing to serve and letting them know that this project is about to get underway or is underway, is getting underway. And it is an opportunity to alert them to the kinds of opportunities that you're hoping to make available for them so that they can start thinking about it, start thinking in this way. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. One of the things that you really want to make sure that you do uh, in terms of the information that you're gathering is creating uh, an opportunity for people to provide their contact information so that you can get back in touch with them after they have responded, uh, especially if they are responding in terms of saying that they would like more information, they would like to become involved in the project, they want to um, support the project in some way. So key information to pick up there. But other types of information that you're, you're looking at as you develop your questions is around the demographics. And whether you're dealing with a broader community outreach, uh, for example, this project for in Savannah is uh, not targeting a specific uh, demographic sector, but rather a broader community to try to bring all segments of the community into the project. But even if you're looking at one sector of a community, there's still demographic issues within that. Um, what type of work are people doing? And, and, and this, again, is one of the pieces of information that can be very helpful to you as you're building your um, membership and sponsorship uh, packages and components. Are, are people business owners? Are they, do they work with nonprofits? Are they students? Are they entrepreneurs? You want to uh, see what kind of income level are you reaching out to in terms of the, the people who you're actually connecting with. Race, age, uh, time and community, all of these things can be really very important pieces of information for your ability to understand if you are actually reaching the community that you are hoping to reach. Another piece is that as you go through this, you want to understand what their perception of need is. What's missing from their perspective? What are their expectations? Is this, uh, what's, the, what's their idea of a community radio station? Do they have any idea what it is, what it's about? And if they do, what do they think is important to be added to the community communications mix? Uh, what program areas, what issues are top issues. For example, one of our uh, interesting finds when we were addressing the issues that people felt were most um, crucial to be being brought forward and, and presented and discussed and explored in this new venue, the top issue was the environment. And, and when you speak to people, and I speak to people about that, that, that this was the top issue that people, and it was over 60% of the respondents, 
wanted more information, more science-based information on environment, people were shocked. So, so you learn a lot, and it's important to think about the questions as you develop them. One of the key pieces that you want to identify as you move forward with your development process is identifying the interest level of people. You know, are, are there people in your outreach, in your data collection, that are indicating that they would like to support the project with, with time, with talent, with money? Um, and again, you want to make sure you can collect the information on how to contact those folks if there are. Um, another piece that I found was really very valuable uh, uh, in terms of looking forward to the um, sustainability of the project was identifying what kind of support or sponsorship programs people would be interested in engaging in. And we had one uh, entire section on what type of memberships, individual memberships, family memberships. Um, and then we also had are people, are people interested who were business owners, small business owners, uh, were they interested in, in a business sponsorship program? And if so, what kind of components did they want to see in that? Um, same thing in terms of another area that we explored is what we were calling a community sponsorship, which was really more um, focused on opportunities for nonprofit organizations and included things like would they like to see sponsorship opportunities in exchange for volunteer hours and uh, in-kind donation type things. So once you build that, once you build all of your questions, then you've got to get the, the, the tools out there. And you've got to reach out into the community and if you have a team, if you have a team you're working with, each of those members needs to be looking at their own individual uh, community networks. Because if you can get these tools out through Oh, uh, the membership of a, you know, you go to a nonprofit organization and they're interested in, in supporting the project and helping you with the survey, getting the information in the generic out to all of their membership through their network. So, so you're leveraging the team's community connections to really bring in the broadest possible uh, participation in your information gathering. Um, you want to see what resources that your organization has. Uh, you want to use everything you can, website, Facebook, Twitter, all the other social media tools. And the same goes for your team members, email lists, social media vehicles. And then finally, you want to take a look at making sure that you get press releases out, um, sometimes that, <laughs> that has more impact than others. But, but you can sometimes even get full um, stories done about the project in your local weekly community papers. So once you, you've deployed the tools, um, you want to get to the part that can be um, one of the most difficult pieces, especially if you haven't been working primarily through online survey, uh, you know, with an online tool that does uh, electronic compilation and summary. And sometimes you can't. Sometimes you really need to be aware that not everybody has computer or internet access. And so when you're trying to target uh, a full range of community members, you, you want to make sure you're thinking about that there are people who don't have that type of, they're either not technologically inclined or they don't have the resources and access. And make sure that you're, you're um, creating opportunities for them to participate as well. It's a lot tougher because you have to do all the um, physical compilation of the data, but it, it's important if you really want to get your full um, community engaged in, in your exploration of what's needed for the community. And then once you've done all of that, you know, you've analyzed your data, you now know how to what you've got, and you use that data as you go about your next steps in creating the uh, not only your support network, your outreach network, your fundraising, but once you get the license, 
you have a tremendous amount of information about what people want to see in terms of programming. So there it is. Go get them. Great. Thanks so much, Vicki. Um, uh, thanks for that. And well, of course, if people have any questions for Vicki, we're going to hold those till the end. Uh, keep them saved up. Put them in the chat, chat box at the end, and then uh, we'll be able to, uh, to field those calls. So I just want to move uh, right along to Danielle Chenoweth. Uh, Danielle uh, has been engaged with Community Radio for 22 years. She is the founder of the Urbana Champaign Independent Media Center in Urbana, Illinois, and their low-power radio station, Radio Free Urbana. After working here with us at the CTS Radio Project for three years, she returned to her profession as a consultant at PIXO, where she helps groups plan their work and assess community needs. Uh, Danielle, thanks for joining us tonight. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you. How, how's the sound out there, folks? Hello. Good evening. I can still Good. hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. I'll get started. So together we worked for 10 years to pass the Local Community Radio Act, and we finally spent the final hours of Congress in December of 2010. But actually the dream of that act relies on groups successfully applying for licenses and building stations. So that's where you come in. Because of the way that FCC gives out license, there's actually about five generations of community radio. Um, so you can all you can think of yourselves as the fifth graduating class of this group, and you'll actually be the largest one in U.S. history. So congratulations. Um, keeping with that metaphor, I'm excited to be an alumni of this of community radio and part of its support system for you. There's a lot of us out there who are excited to help you. So. I just want to let you know that you're not alone in this, and there's other stations across the country really excited for you, rooting for you, and we're here to help. Um, so I want to talk today about the way that radio is changing and what that means for how we engage our communities to build stations. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about our community radio station here in Urbana, Illinois. It's WRFU, uh, Radio Pre Urbana and talk about how we operate and build participatory uh, radio. Um, we're one model that fits our particular community, particular community well, but there's many communities and many models, so we'll be um, giving you one. But before we talk about um, kind of strategies, I want to kind of fly up into the sky together and look down on our situation from far away. So I want to like look historically for a moment and kind of contextualize this concept of community engagement within that. So first off, what communities expect from radio is actually changing. I've been at DJ since 1995, so I've gotten a chance to kind of um, see how community radio has changed over time. And I'll say, as I think we know, solo DJ on the air, having their private channel of favorite commercial music, that they can do that online now. That's not actually a need of the community at this point. If a listener wants to hear the same genre over again, you they can tune to Pandora on their phone or computer. Um, it's also the case, and I think it's important we be honest, that community radio has historically attracted some people who have a lot to say but don't have so much to listen to. And so I think that with the Internet, by producing multi-way media, that's changed that. And people expect a conversation. And that's a good expectation for them to have. So I feel like as we construct these stations, um, thinking about how we operate radio, that um, kind of translates to how we kind of set up that the radio station. Um, listening and responding to what we learn is actually unusual. Mainstream media can't provide that with its automatic rotation and its robots running studios. And so what we have to offer as community radio is listen and respond to our communities. We do not just sit in a black box broadcasting our diva you know, concept of reality, which has been some of community radio's history. Um, community radio thrives when it has its finger on the pulse of the community. So um, when it's talking about and sharing what's relevant now and here, that's hard to come by. And ultimately, that's the juicy spot. That's what we have to offer our communities. So that's the first thing, is that what people expect from radio is changing. 
The second is who starts radio stations is also changing. So community radio stations seem to be moving in the direction of working in coalition instead of being founded by a single person or group. This makes a lot of sense because coalitions bring energy and content um, to make it work, and it does illustrate a community radio station. So the next generation of community radio stations, that's you, community engagement is going to be more important than ever. And you will be distinguished by your community engagement and also your integration of technology. Really, community radio stations are the, the these are future multimedia centers. And I think thinking about engagement, and I'll talk a little bit about technologies that help to engage through lots of different venues that where radio is included in that. Um, so I just I don't want to repeat what Vicky said. I feel like she gave some really good nuts and bolts um, concepts. I just want to add a few things to what she talked about. So the first is with strategies for community engagement to start with collaboration. So if you start your project and then you invite people, you're going to end up with your friends. But if you really start um, with groups involved from the beginning, and I think Vicki's statement of making sure there's a good mission fit I think is important, but I also think it's important to have kind of a big tent approach. So kind of um, balancing the desire for a big tent with like making sure that there aren't inherent contradictions in your vision with your collaborators. Um, and so starting with collaboration means balancing the need for vision and leadership, and that's important. And sometimes amongst progressive groups, we forget vision and leadership has an important role to play. Balancing that with sharing power um, is really important. So we start with collaboration. And when doing collaboration, we really start with listening. And so one of the things you can do is you can organize listening sessions. And Prometheus has great popular education tools that can help with setting agendas and activities that help to gather information rather than talking at people. There's a tendency when we're really excited about something to kind of come in and talk about our vision and talk big. And it's important to inspire, but it's also important to really make sure that those are those first meetings are engaged meetings where there's a lot of listening and there's a lot of participation. And so I, I encourage you to make use of the popular educals that Prometheus has for that. Um, so the third uh, strategy I would say is catch the wave. So actively cultivating partners involves noticing where the energy is in your community and following it. You know, community radio is really community organizing. So a lot of the principles that come out of community organizing are so essential to community radio. And that means that relationships are key. Absolutely, surveys and you know, um, connecting through the service is important. And also really cultivating face-to-face -face relationships is also important. Active invitations are needed. Um, especially for marginalized populations, especially for women, for queer folks. People have been shut out. They don't, you build it and they don't come. That's not how we operate. So it's really important that there be active invitations and cultivation face-to-face um, -face, a la community organizing. Last point for strategy is don't be afraid to change. It's really important to think about these as living organisms, our stations, need to change and that organizations get stale in the five to ten year period. Um, so it's important to keep reinventing yourself. And that that means staying in contact with your community's needs. Um, okay, so those are some strategies. I'm sure DARPA will add a number of really great strategies. I think WGXC is one of the best models for community engagement. So I'm excited to hear her stories. I just want to talk a little bit um, about the Independent Media Center and RSU, and just kind of tell that story um, and show some pictures as a kind of inspiration and an example of what engagement can look like. So there were 12 of us who started the Independent Media Center in 2000. We met in a, a living room. We collectivized our equipment. And we were really interested in developing a nursery of projects. A, a, to create an enabling structure. And I think that's what these radio stations slash community media centers are. They're really like enabling structures for change in our communities. 
So we wanted this structure to help lots of little but bubbling kind of media and arts projects to to get rich, you know, nutrients and roots and to prosper, to grow and prosper. So we wanted to provide space, resources, and atmosphere that would draw artists and community members together to investigate local problems, design solutions, and transform our community. Thirteen years later, we own a post office building with a performance venue, art gallery, and studios. Uh, and Leah is showing the pictures. You can see our lovely um, IMC in the pictures. Um, community radio station, media training facility, and public access computer center, a maker space with experiments with robotics, glass, and sewing. So we kind of expanded the concept of maker space. We have a library of books, zines, costumes, and musical instruments for checkout. And we also have a bike co-op. Um, we run a Books to Prisoners program, a computer help desk, and host hundreds of websites and listservs. We also publish a monthly independent newspaper. And many, many grassroots groups meet in our space and use the resources to further their work and campaigns. We have over 1,200 volunteers. So we went from 12 to 1,200. Um, and you know, we used a very uh, horizontal model of organizing. We've been very careful to keep our policies slim and to keep our gatekeepers to a minimum. And so we really have tried to use a decentralized spokesperson model where that even within WRFU, there are programming committees. So each hour or two hours of programming is actually programmed by a group of people. That helps. Um, People have backup in case they can't show up. And it also kind of, we wanted to get away from the last shock jock DJ model of, of radio and really have these spaces on our station be collaborations. Um, and so we don't have an executive director. We do have a station manager because that's an important uh, component for the FCC. But we really operate as a collective. Um, and all of the members of the station and the, the DJs uh, participate in the volunteerism and help to run the station. Um, so we really try when there's a particular energy or campaign in the community, we try to get behind that energy and bolster it and grow it. Um, so we reach out in um, a partnership and we make our resources available to amplify that issue or effort. Um, so I'm going to give some examples of what partnership is look like. And I actually saw a question: Did your radio project have a program director? No, we don't. We are all program directors. That's basically how we how we play. Is we all, we all um, participate in programming. So some examples of what partnership has looked like, and us. Um, okay. Yep. So two minutes. I am going to wrap up. So a couple of. Um, examples I want to give. We, um, the Siphon Hill Neighborhood Rights Campaign was born out of the IMC and RFU. Um, we have a group, a civil rights group that meets in our space. Um, and they used WRFU to organize a series of toxic tours in a neighborhood that had been plagued with cancer for decades. Um, and they taped testimonials, produced a multimedia piece, piece both in radio and video called Toxic Legacy Douglas Park Residents in their own words. This helped to get the attention of the local city council and EPA, and the power company has been forced to clean up that site with um, oversight from the neighborhood. Um, so another example was that we had a group visionaries educating youth and adults who wanted to work with African American young men to prevent their future incarceration. And we produced Citizen Watch, which was video and radio, um, to to um, show disparate treatment of African American youth and primarily uh, white students on campus, um, and we actually uh, the our folks um, were charged with felony eavesdropping for eavesdropping on the police, even though they were in a public arena, and so that became a big fight. That also really raised a lot of uh, First Amendment rights issues. There were a lot of community members who got involved, and we want that fight and actually the state of Illinois has um, changed that law and our case was cited in that legislation. Um, 
We've helped to get secret charges dropped against a Moroccan activist who was detained by the FBI and INS under the Patriot Act. That was a really important piece. We blew the whistle on taser torture in our local jail. And um, we helped to raise the profile of a lesbian nurse who was fired when she came out as a lesbian at her hospital um, where she worked. So these were some of the things as we really saw where campaigns were. And we kind of came in and said, okay, like, here's tools, here's resources. And the campaigns oftentimes came to the IMC and we interwove. And so the IMC is really, um, and RFU is considered kind of the centerpiece for a lot of uh, the, the center uh, support system or nervous system to support a lot of campaigns. Um, currently working on a no new jail campaign and the box and um, a Save Our Libraries campaign. So we got a lot of stuff going on. Um, and our multimedia kind of supports that. I'm going to end with just um, a final note on community engagement. And that is to really think of your community radio stations as multimedia community centers. And the reason why this is important to the topic of community engagement is because by being able to broadcast through multiple venues, um, it, the amplification effect is much greater. So groups who are working on issues or community problems are really drawn to places that can be a nervous system for multimedia. It also means that they don't have to come to your station. Like the, they, there can be kind of, for example, we work with the Black House at the African American Cultural Center, and they actually broadcast out of their center. Um, and we use remote broadcasting and a wireless link and internet connection to broadcast. So, so our vision is everything on our stage is broadcast. Our few meetings and teach-ins are broadcast. Working groups are various maker space and books to prisoners have shows that are on the radio station. We live stream. We're working on remote broadcasting. And we're working on an automatic push to our public access television station. So what we want to be is basically a one-stop shop. You come you broadcast on RFU, and all of a sudden there's massive amplification of the work you're doing across social media, across the internet, radio, web, television, et cetera, and that there's this remote broadcasting aspect. And the Prometheus Radio Project has a project called Internet in a Box, which actually helps you go through the process of web streaming and remote broadcasting. And I think that's an important piece because a lot of times a lot of activity happening in your community, but it's hard sometimes to get people to travel, especially in a city environment, to your station to broadcast. And it's not always necessary for that. So people can keep their identity of where their organizing center is happening, but contribute content to you. And actually, I'm going to hand it over to Dharma, and WGXC does this with a couple of different studios across the river, and they've done a great job with this. So. I will end there. I'm happy to answer questions uh, after the presentation. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks so much, Danielle. It's a really uh, inspiring model um, at the at the IMC um, in Urbana Champaign, and uh, I hope one day actually to get to visit it. It looks super awesome. Um, but I'm just going to move quickly uh, over to um, to Dharma, our final speaker. And we we started a bit late, so I'm hoping folks will be able to hang on the line a, a little after this um, after Dharma's. Um, talk, and then uh, we'll definitely uh, take um, a bunch of questions. We'll field questions through again through the chat box there. So uh, Dharma Daily has been running, has been making and promoting community media for over 15 years, including starting a community radio station in upstate New York, which is WGXC Hands On Radio. And that station launched with 100 programmers, most of whom had never made radio before. And UGXC just celebrated um, two years on the air this February. So uh, thanks, Dharma, for joining us. Hi, thanks. So um, I'm in a very rural area with a bad phone connection. So if I if I disappear, I have put um, a link to what I'm going to say in in the chat, and also giving you my my um, email address, which you're welcome to to follow up with me. Um, if there's one thing that I can get across to you is that you can totally do this kind of needs assessment. Um, as I was listening to Vicki, 
I was hearing all of these great things, and, and also um, Danielle, all these great things that you can do to understand your community better. And I started to get this big knot in my stomach because I remember sitting at a table when it was just the four of us thinking about applying for a station and being completely daunted by all of the work that we had to put in. Um, and somehow we did get through it. And um, it's great if you, if you have somebody on your team that knows how to do surveys and has, does formal research for a living and all that kind of stuff and knows how to do SES and demographics and blah, 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 blah. Awesome. Awesome. But if you don't, you can still do this. Um, so I just um, I want to focus on just a couple of things that I think are really simple things that anybody can do for for needs assessment that might help as a when as a startup when you know everything is you're going to be doing all the work. So um, so the first one is really to integrate your research into the work you do. Um, so point one is don't delegate. Integrate. Um, integrate your team into your research. So. There will be time in the future, maybe when you're more established, where you'll have more professional or more formal techniques um, that you'll be doing for assessment. Um, and that's awesome. But for a startup, especially having that gut level knowledge of where people are at in your community and what, like as Danielle said, what's exciting to them and what's interesting and re really, you know, strikes a chord. Um, you want to know that yourself, and you and you want as many people on your team to know that as you can. Um, so I would suggest recruiting people. It's, you don't need the skills. You, what you need is the interest and the curiosity. And if you have that interest and curiosity about what's going on in your community, um, it, it's infectious. And it will infect your team, and, um, and, you'll, and you'll be on your way, regardless of what kind of you know, research background you have. Um, the second part about don't delegate, integrate, is really um, is to integrate research into your tech. So you're, you're doing everything anyway, um, but if you ask, add that extra level of thinking about, okay, well, what can we learn from this? How can we learn this? How, what can we learn about our, you know, our community needs? Um, or what's, what's striking a chord, what's not? Um, and there's just a ton of, like, once you start thinking about that, you're going to find all of these little ways um, that you can kind of tweak what you're doing to get some feedback. Um, I think the slides that um, you're seeing are, you know these events that we did. Um, we didn't have a, a, a we didn't have a radio station. We just had a, a dream of a radio station. Um, we had some you know, crappy gear, but we could go out and we could webcast with that. And in this example, we're taking over an um, an empty lot. You know, we showed up in the morning and cleaned the needles off of it and that sort of thing, um, and set up a webcast and started asking people, you know, our interview questions in the beginning were just always talking, asking people what they, what they wanted to hear on the radio, what they thought was missing, all those great questions that Vicki had. Um, and, um, and we used this little um, very simple device of the, the community radio tree where people would stick a leaf on the tree every time they had an idea. And we brought that from event to event, and it created this, this very approachable institutional memory that anchored us around what people were really telling us um, about, about the needs. Um, so the second thing, my second point is just always ask. Just always be in the mood to ask and get out in front of people. The more you can get out in front of them early and often, um, the, the faster you're going to learn and the deeper you're, you're going to go. Um, and we did this in more than one way. We, we were both strategic, so we thought about our, we sat down at the kitchen table after we, um, you know, there was months of dreaming about the station at a kitchen table before it happened. And, you know, pretty much the day after we decided we were going to apply, uh, within like three days we were at a boxing match in Catskill. Um, I'm not a boxing fan, but that's what people come out for. So we had this kind of like, all right, let's go where people are. And we were, we were tabling there in front of the firehouse and going like, well, we're thinking about applying for a radio station to be like on the air. Um, and we really did that for the like next three years until we got on the air. And then we didn't have to ask, you know, that and that way anymore. So there was this kind of broad um, approach of tabling an event and showing up and, and um, making media and seeing how people responded to it. But then there was also this more strategic approach about we, we sort of sat again at the kitchen table and just with, with some butcher paper thought, well, who's, who, once we had that map of where our um, listening area was going to be, we sort of brainstormed, okay, what is the community of communities here? Who else is in this area? 
And it wasn't a very formal process. It was just a brainstorm. Um, but once we had that documented, we could ask other people, you know, if there was stuff missing. And then we thought, who are the people in those communities that have, you know, that have respect? Who do the farmers respect? And we stop at the farm stands, you know, when we're getting our our groceries and say, hey, you know, who who do you think um, if we, you know, we should ask if it was starting this project, who could we have possibly asked about, you know, doing this? Um, uh, uh, in the that the farmers really respect, um, and and uh, and we went out and, and did sort of more informational interviews with those folks, and they eventually built relationships with enough of those leaders that they became our our radio council, um, who um, not who helped us to create our value statement and our mission statement and name the radio station and really give it that direction. Um, that seemed right for us in our project. Um, so always ask. Um, and the third point is, um, really is, is don't just ask for people's opinions. Go beyond opinion and find out why. Um, a lot of times when you're doing sort of design research, if you ask people why, or if you ask their opinion about what they like or they don't like, um, you might not get um, a very thoughtful answer. You might and you might not. Um, so and I encourage you to also um, think about um, asking follow-up questions that people about um, why they want, why do they think that X group isn't getting the coverage in the area that they need. Um, and you know, supposedly if you do this five times in a row, you will get to a, a point where you get to a root cause. And for what you really want to know, as Vicki said, is really how people are thinking about media, how they're experiencing media. Um, what they're really listening to, not just what they're saying they're listening to. Um, and so, um, you know, you want to really um, dig into that if you can. And simply, uh, and simply following up with, um, with asking the right questions, like asking not just what you like and what you don't like, but why why do you think this, why do you think that, why is this happening, why is that happening, you'll get deeper understanding. So um, those are my um, points, and I, or like the other speakers, please feel free to contact me if you have questions about any of this stuff. Um, I'm always happy to help radio stations get on the air. So thanks. Great, thanks so much, Dharma. Um, that was awesome. Uh, and thanks again to all um, three of our speakers. It's been so great uh, to hear about the different strategies that people have, and to also um, just go over. I think also the specific strategies that um, all three of you have used in, in the um, different radio projects that you have been or are a part of. Um, thank you. I see there's some uh, text chat box applause for all, and I g agree. And I guess I just want to uh, open it up to folks who are, uh, who are out there on the call. Um, we are right at 9 o'clock, but uh, as long as it's okay with our presenters, if we can uh, maybe have uh, 5 to 10 minutes, let's say, of um, of questions, and I'm going to facilitate these questions. So uh, I'm going to really prioritize the the questions that have to do specifically with this topic. Um, questions that have to do with um, nuts and bolts of programming, of all of these uh, different things. Um, keep in mind that we're having a ton of um, trainings that are coming up. There's a whole bunch of trainings. There's a training specifically on what can and can't you say on the air. There's a training on how to set up a small broadcast and production studio. There's um, there's a training on where to put your tower site, all of these things. So right now we're really trying to focus the questions on community engagement, outreach, uh, needs assessment, marketing strategies, whatever, whatever the case may be, whatever your approach might be, and, and how to effectively do that. And also to ask for, uh, you know, maybe to probe more about what, um, what these folks used in their on their particular with their particular radio projects to get to get going and to involve different people. So uh, let's. Um, Let's see what we've got here now. Of course, they're going to come in all at once. Um, right, so what happens if people don't have uh, reference to, um, to radio, haven't had, um, haven't had any experience with radio, or are maybe struggling to, um, to figure out what the relevance is of radio? And I know, I know uh, you folks talked about that a little, but is, is there somebody, one of, um, one of you folks, I, I think definitely, Danielle, you talked a little bit about the importance of radio as just one piece of a broader media strategy. And, and maybe uh, you or Dharma or, or Vicki as well want to talk about um, how to engage specifically 
um, marginalized folks who may may not have a sense of where radio fits into like a broader um, outreach or community building strategy. Well, this is Vicki. Um, mm -hmm. We actually had um, some people within the organization um, that were very much convinced that radio is dead and mm -hmm. radio is passe and radio is, you know, there's absolutely no point in doing a uh, power radio station because everybody's on the internet. <clears throat> and um, as we developed the questionnaire, it was one of the things that we wanted to, to uh, find out uh, in the community about were, were they right? You know, uh, it, was this a, a waste of time and energy to, to move forward with this because nobody's really listening? And so developing questions around people's experience with radio in their current listening behavior, but also bringing forward suggestions for the types of possibilities, that, for programming possibilities, that might be made available through radio. And and uh, again, that was that sort of two-way street where you're stimulating people to think about the possibilities as opposed to simply collecting their ideas. Right. Um, this is Dharma. So our, mm -hmm. our approach to that is it's not going to happen overnight. I mean, we were talking to people about radio, and they would just gave us look at us like we had five heads. Um, so out. And we, we, the day we brought out the program schedule, and, I, and I, that felt like a defeat to me, but what I kind of learned was that sort of having a prototype, people can rip against. So if you actually get out there and make some media with folks that's part of your dream, then they can riff on that. You know, or if they see that program, that sample program guide, then they'll say, what could you change? Um, so we did a lot of um, like kind of like sample events or things that were in the spirit of what we were trying to accomplish. And that really helped us to get um, like a solid understanding of, of where people, you know, what people responded to. Great. And Danielle, did you have anything you wanted to, to add there? or? I would just say, um, I don't when the, when talking about this, I usually don't lead with radio. I don't even really talk about radio because I feel like it's really about community. And we have and so talking about dot, like staying away from the technology or the venue and talking about what are our needs. So in our community, right now one of our biggest needs is that eighty percent of African American young men are unemployed in Champaign Urbana and 80% of those who go to jail are African-American, even though 13% in the county are African-American. That's a very clear need, and we talk about that need, and then we talk about, okay, what are we going to do about that particular situation? Uh, okay, so let's, you know, let's, let's take the first steps. We'll do a ban-the-box campaign, or we're going to oppose jail expansion, or there's various things that we can do. And then we talk about, okay, eventually it, it gets to how do we – contact people? How do we build this conversation that we need to have around this really dire issue of the new Jim Crow in our community? And then we talk about the different ways we can do that, and radio becomes a solution to the problem. Um, and so I really I really think that um, I know that the, the application is coming up very quickly, and so you know there are very clearly technical aspects to applying. But when, when we have conversations um, about you know, w w without this particular time deadline, we really talk about the issues first. And so when you have those listening sessions, you have those conversations, you can start with those conversations. The other thing, and this is kind of quick and dirty, but I, you know, I, I'm happy to share, like, here's uh, 50 victories that we won because we had a radio, sh radio station. And so there's, like, really demonstrated success that you can – that you can tell from when somebody has a radio station versus when they don't and what they're able to accomplish. That gets people's attention really quickly. So, 
Yeah, that was the question I, exactly I was thinking about is if we, if, and I think that that's something that we might not be able to do in the next three minutes, but that there, there is this list that exists of exactly all the victories. And I think that that's some of the awesome stuff that you've been showing is what are all the things that we that the radio has helped to uh, get the word out about, and that is the importance of the media making. And then also, what are all the things that um, that we've gotten excited about because we have radio? Like, it's I think they feed off each other, and I think that that's a really important point that um, that everybody's making is that you know, yeah, a lot of people often hear at Prometheus as well are like, really, you work when I tell people I work in radio, but that's that's the key thing is that it's it's such an amazing starting point for so much other work that can be done uh, in the various communities that we're all a part of. Um, is there are there any other uh, questions about uh, about community outreach? About um, I see that people were asking for sample questionnaires, and I guess um, I just want to ask uh, what will happen is that when I post this um, this webinar the in the archives, I'll also make sure to include other resources that people can look at. So I'll include, um, Dharma, your uh, blog post with, uh, the, with the points from your presentation and, um, and of course, direct people to um, the work that Vicki's doing with her consulting. And then uh, also, um, I can put a link to the C and Urbana Champaign so that uh, folks can look at the work that's happening you know, in different parts of the country and what, what people are working on um, to get their stations so, going and to have had stations going. Vicki, sorry, is that you there? Yeah, Leah, you know, I mean, if folks want to contact me, just, you know, email me at the website. I'll be happy to share the uh, survey stuff. That's great. Yeah, and that, that is, that's a great offer, and, and I would encourage people to take that up. So um, people can uh, get a hold of uh, Vicki again at weeksconsulting.com, so if they want to um, find her, um, her contact there. And then, um, like I said, when this posts, I'll, I'll make sure that all of the other, um, all of the other, contacts and resources are are there. Um, so I think what we're going to do then is uh, wrap up the call where uh, I just want to thank everyone again for joining us tonight. Uh, it's been really inspiring to hear about all the work that these three folks have done and continue to do. And uh, I know I feel both humbled and extremely excited about um, the kind of push that we have in the next bunch of weeks uh, to help folks get their, station, get their applications in to start their stations. Um, if anyone needs to get a hold of us here at Prometheus, of course, you can uh, check out our website. Uh, if you have any questions about the upcoming webinars, you can get a hold of me, and I'll just put my, at my email address here. It's just lgerardo at prometheusradio.org. Uh, and you can, um, I can make sure that people are getting, oh, I realize there's a typo in there, of course, because I'm typing. Um, and I can let you folks know what other trainings are coming up. Also keep an eye out on, uh, on our website for those. Uh, that's just prometheusradio.org slash webinars. And there's more going up pretty much every day. There will be about another uh, 12 in the coming week, sometimes two in a week. So um, you can uh, keep an eye out for that. Uh, thanks again to Vicki Weeks, to Danielle Chenoweth, and to Dharma Daly for joining us this evening. And uh, I really appreciate everyone's hard work in a, um, towards uh, building uh, participatory radio in the U.S. Um, thanks again, and uh, I hope to see you all in the upcoming webinars that will be happening in the future. Thank you. <laughs>